blood and power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder work and power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder work and power in the precious blood of the lamb would you be free from your passion and pride there's power in the blood power in the blood come for a cleansing to calvary's tide there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb would you be wider much wider than snow there's power in the blood power in the blood sin stains are lost in his life-giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of you do service for Jesus your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to see? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, You may be seated. We'll go ahead and have our ushers come forward this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness in bringing your people together once again on this Lord's Day to worship the holy name of Christ, to magnify Him, to exalt Him. God, we thank You for the time that we've already shared together this morning, bearing one another's burdens, encouraging one another, ministering to one another. We thank You, God, for every single person that's, that's assembled here today. We thank you for the testimony of their faith. We thank you for the life that they live uh, to exemplify and, and magnify the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that today we would take an opportunity to put all distractions out of our minds, to throw off the things that hinder us from worshiping you and serving you as we ought. And that you would help us to collectively worship the name of Jesus as we sing, as we give, as we observe the table, as, as we submit ourselves to the preaching of your truth. Lord, we pray that Jesus would be worshipped among us today. And we pray that by his grace, we would be changed more into his image. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. Take a hymnal, turn to hymn number 423. We're going to stand and sing, I Need Thee Every Hour. Hymn number 423, I Need Thee Every Hour. Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can be so full. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every standing this morning for our scripture reading. Our scripture reading is going to come from Hebrews chapter 10 beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere, sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're going to continue standing as we turn to uh, hymn number 235. As we sing the wonderful cross, hymn number 235, the wonderful cross. I'm sorry, let me change that. It's hymn number 239. Hymn number 239, The Wonderful Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Yeah. 
his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow go down. Did there such love and sorrow me? Well, as we set aside this first Sunday of the month to celebrate the Lord's table, we are reminded from that first celebration where the Lord Jesus 
took the bread, took the cup, and it was the great leveler, it was the great uniter to let them know that whether or not Peter, James, and John, who uh, were referred to as those that are in that three-person inner circle and John even being the closest, the greatest thing that Jesus did was to let them all know that no one is more special than another when it comes to redemption that they all require the same sufficient sacrifice, which is the blood of Jesus the Christ. And so, you may um, be inclined as your default to judge yourself by someone else, but the Scripture teaches us that the great judge, the great measuring stick, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we all fall short of God's glory. And so the celebration of the table is not our own merits. It is the merits of Christ. It is the work of Christ. It is the work of His uh, redemption on the cross. And so when we come in on a day like today, we come in with all kinds of thoughts in our heads, all kinds of plans for the days to come, all kinds of thoughts about what's happened in, in previous days. And I want to encourage you as best you can this side of heaven to push by God's grace, to pray for Him to help you push from your mind everything but Him. And I know that if that's going to happen, that's going to be a work of God. Because there's too many things that cloud our heads and cloud our judgment. But by God's grace, pray that everything would be totally focused upon Jesus the Son. That everything else would be Escaping the mind. And if it does impulsively come to the head, I pray it would be a fleeting coming to the head and it would quickly disappear and the focus would return right back to where it needs to be, Jesus the Christ. But let me tell you something in light of what I just said. There's coming a day where we will never have to say that what I just said. There's coming a day where our minds will literally be fixed Upon the Son, Jesus Christ. There's coming a day where my mind won't scatter anymore. Where it won't go impulsively to random, sinful, bizarre thoughts at a moment. They'll be forever fixed on the Son, Jesus Christ. And as we celebrate the table, that is the great promise as well. That there's coming a day where we will celebrate this table with Him forever without any struggle in our mind with sin at all. Looking forward to that as well. And all of that is accomplished, finished, through Christ on the cross. We're looking forward to the fulfillment and realization of that accomplished work. But for now, we do our best this side of heaven to celebrate it in the way he ordained it. Sinful as we may be. If there is something that's clouding your mind and it has preoccupied you more than Christ, maybe it's sin. Maybe it's an alt with a brother. Maybe it's a conflict that seems to cloud your judgment in such a way that you would say in your mind, gosh, I don't know whether I should or not celebrate this. But I would encourage you, refrain. I would encourage you in good conscience to refrain from celebrating the table. But I would also encourage you, get that issue resolved. Get that fixed As far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. That's what the Bible says. You judge your own heart, you examine your own conscience. If you're having trouble doing that, the psalmist gives us instructions. Search me, O God. See if there be any unclean thing in me. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. All of these things are prayers from the Psalms and maybe that would be the good direction for us to take as we silently pray to the Lord. But you do business with God before we celebrate the table. Let's take a few moments just to spend time privately with the Lord at this moment.
As you continue to be bowed there before the Lord, I'm going to ask our men if they would come and prepare to serve at the table. As the bread is passed, celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ.
1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As the cup is passed, continue the celebration of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to celebrate your table. Through the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ, by the regenerating power and sealing of your Holy Spirit, you have caused us to be born again through your living word. And you have given us hope eternal through the deposit of your Holy Spirit guaranteeing our redemption. We celebrate that you have sealed us unto the day of redemption. You will keep us until we see you face to face. Now, God, we pray you would use your word to strengthen us, to make us more faithful to you. Revive our hearts, O oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9. I want to um, say a word of thanksgiving and celebration for Brother Jimmy's word last week in regards to John chapter 6. Why are you here? What is your motivation for coming? I'll make reference to that in just a little bit, but many of you know that uh, Jimmy was filling in for us as, as um, uh, Margaret and I spent some time ministering to John and Reva. Uh, this evening at 6 p.m., we will celebrate the, the life, although a short one, of Hallie Mae Kidd, who is uh, John and Reva's baby that um, went home to be with the Lord, and we will be celebrating that this afternoon at 6 p.m., here at the church. If you can make it, that's great. If you can't, we understand and you can be praying for them. I'll say that their, their heart is broken, but their faith is extremely strong and I'm thankful. Um, while we're talking about that, I'll also tell you that uh, this Wednesday night, a good friend of mine, who uh, Doug Cullen, who celebrates uh, serving with Choose Life Ministries, he was here some years ago, will be here again this Wednesday uh, giving a, a a presentation that's phenomenal for even the children. His wife does a presentation for the children and he does a presentation for um, the adults and the youth. I would encourage you to be here this Wednesday night at 7. I think you'll be blessed. And I pray that you'll be blessed this morning as we turn our attention to God's Word. We're in 1 Kings chapter 9. We have just um, looked at in 1 Kings Solomon's early years in his kingship and he has been called of God to build the temple, called of God to build it according to the specifications that he's given. He also has built for himself a palace. There are many things to be said in contrast to Solomon and to David. David was a man after God's own heart. This is Solomon's dad. He uh, was a sinner, but he responded to sin the right way with a broken and contrite heart. Solomon, although for all of his wisdom, and the Bible declares that he is the wisest man to ever live on the earth, um, not to be on the earth, that would have been Jesus, but he is wise. And in all of his wisdom, there is a buildup that is happening in chapters 9 and 10 that will lead us to chapter 11. Now, we're not going to do that today. We're not going that far today. We're just going to talk about the early part of chapter 9. But chapter 9 and chapter 10 are a buildup of how glorious and just magnificent and wealthy and prosperous and beautiful Solomon's successes are, earthly speaking. And it leads us to chapter 11, which is the fall of King Solomon. We could say it like this. We're about to begin reading about Solomon's best life now. And his best life now, as good as it can be, still crumbles. And he needs a redeemer. And he needs a rescuer. 
So the point of 9, 10, and 11 is, as good as it can get, humans will still destroy it because of their connection to a rebellious Adam and Eve. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1. As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you... If you will walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel, but if you turn aside from following me, you or your children... And do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them, and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. And Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss. And they will say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. Let me read verse 9 again. And see how senseless what they did actually really was. Because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. They abandoned the one who rescued them. Are we guilty of doing the same? Well, in light of 1 Kings chapter 9, this is after the prayer of Solomon who has called out to God on behalf of Israel and he has called out to God and saying, We want to commemorate this temple that has been built that bears your name and we pray that it would honor God. I believe that Solomon's heart was in the right place on what he was praying for. And the Lord replies, responds back, answers Solomon. And this leads to a question in the text and I will say that honestly I'm going to springboard with this text, not do a ton of expositing from it. And springboard from it, from, from, a, from something that I really feel pressed to bring to our attention as a body, that is honestly a springboard not only from this text, but a springboard from what Jimmy mentioned to you last week. Why are you here? What is the purpose? What is the fuel? What is the motivation for you being here? 1 Kings chapter 9 is definitely prayer to God, but this is a case that we read where God is literally answering him and Solomon literally is hearing him. So this begs the question, if Solomon is hearing God and he knows it's God, what about me? How can I hear God? How can I know that I'm hearing God and not just hearing something in my head or hearing my own thoughts or perhaps even hearing Satan. How can I know what I'm hearing? 
Now, you, you may think that you don't have that problem, but inevitably, you will ask a question at some point in time in your life, is, is this God indicating to me to do something? Or is this just my own idea? Is this God leading me to this job, to this relationship, to this location? Is this God speaking to me like he's speaking to Solomon? We hear all kinds of input on this issue from television preachers who say that they had breakfast with Jesus this morning and he told them exactly what they should do, even how much salt to put on their eggs. Now, we would write that off as nonsense because we don't believe that God is audibly speaking to people. But how do we know, how do we know for sure that we are hearing from God if Solomon in this passage is sure he's hearing from God and we believe that he is? Then how do I know that God is speaking to me? Well, we, we are called in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 to... Take every thought captive to Christ. In other words, we are to take every thought that we have, every notion that we have, and put it under the scrutiny of Christ in His Word. Take every thought captive, whether it be a random thought that's wrong and you know it is, and bring it captive or under the Lordship of Christ, or if it's something we need clarity about, we're bringing it under under the Lordship of Christ. But... How do we know for sure that God is saying what he's saying? You know, God didn't tell us what address um, to buy the house at or what uh, person, you know, he didn't write in there the name of your spouse in Hezekiah chapter 4. He didn't do that. So how do we know? How are we sure? Well, I want to go back to an old discipleship that we used Uh, for some time, and I think it's a good one. I think there are some shallow spots in it, but I think it's a good one. And that would be Henry Blackaby writing Experiencing God. Now, my Reformed brothers have a stroke any time that I mention this guy, um, but I think that they're wrong, and I'm not going to shy from mentioning him just because somebody in a Reformed camp didn't like him. Too bad. Reality number four, there were seven realities about how to walk with God and do the will of God, know the will of God and do it. And this was in in pertaining to God speaking. I think he's orthodox when he says this. He said this, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, and through the church to reveal himself, to reveal his purposes, and to reveal his ways. Now you see, Hebrews chapter 1 teaches us that in the past, God spoke through the prophets and spoke in various ways and unique ways. He spoke through a talking donkey. I hope nobody's going to the farm to find out God's will by having a conversation with a horse these days. I hope you're not doing that. I hope you're not going out into the beating sun and finding a bush that's on fire and saying, God, talk to me. I hope you're not doing that because... Hebrews 1 says, in the past he spoke in these ways, but now, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, but now he has spoken to us through the revelation of his son, Jesus Christ, who is the exact representation of his being. Meaning, in these last days he's spoken to us through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1, 14, the Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. This Jesus who now speaks to us, speaks to us through his word because Jesus is the living word. So how does God speak to us? Primarily through his word, through his scriptures. But also agree with Blackaby when he says God speaks through prayer. Now be careful here. Be careful Because when God speaks through prayer, often our heart, which Jeremiah says is deceitful and desperately wicked and above all things, is deceitful. You can think that in your prayers God has told you something when it was not God. It was perhaps the Spirit, but not the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I know? I wasn't high. 
I wasn't hallucinating. How do I know it was God? Well, you take your prayers through the filter of the Word of God. One person told me during their prayers that God was telling them to leave their family. Okay. Um, And most of the time these people have a pattern of stupidity. And they come up with bizarre things. Now, has God ever told Christian people united in Christian love with a Christian family to leave their family, and this, in this particular case, was to pursue another relationship. You ever found that in the Bible? Well, how do I argue with this guy? He swears God told him that. God speaks, and this is important, because you're dealing with all kinds of people who are throwing all kinds of things at you that say, God speaks in this way. God spoke to me and said this. You don't realize how common that phrase is? In our culture, people walking around going, God spoke to me and, and said this to me. Well, give me a chapter and verse as to how he spoke to you. Now, if he pressed something in on your heart, I understand that. But he spoke to you audibly. I mean, now, God speaks through the Bible. He speaks through prayer. He does, but that has to be filtered and guided and inspected by the Word of God, which is true. But he also speaks through circumstances. And I believe that. I believe that 100%. That he speaks through circumstances. Now, this does not mean... That circumstances are foolish circumstances that are not filtered by the Word of God. For example, the other day there was a plane flying out above the field out here. Somebody's flying a plane that makes little writings in the sky and stuff like that. And, and um, so one of the, uh, I don't know if you all have seen this, but they made a smiley face with his uh, puff of smoke that's coming from the back of his plane. Made a smiley face. And so I, I took that as a sign that Margaret needs to smile a little bit more at me uh, and not look at me like I'm in trouble or something. And God showed me that, you see. Now, that's, that's ridiculous. Because on the other side of that, what if on the other side of it, that was a frown, not a smiley face? Somebody's looking at it upside down, sees a smiley face. If I see a smiley face, somebody else sees a frown. What's the deal? You see how those things can be foolish. Now, I'm giving you a, a facetious one, but there are people who after a circumstance make a conclusion that the Bible doesn't support. And you better be careful about that. For instance, I had enough wrecks in my teenage years that I should know by now I shouldn't be driving. I took that as a sign that I shouldn't be driving. And ever since then I've been walking just like Jesus did. I'm more spiritual than y'all. You see how... Just foolish this can become when we start measuring everything by circumstances. Many people in the last few years ago got little crazes over the fact that they thought they saw Virgin Mary. I, I think Virgin Mary was carved in a tree somewhere in, in uh, a location and people were going to see uh, Mary. And um, uh, by the way, Mary's a sinner who needs Jesus, um, needed Christ. So, um, but anyway. God does speak through circumstances. As a matter of fact, our statement of faith does verify that God in His providence does use circumstances to reveal Himself, His purposes, His will. Let me read it to you. It's article number four in our statement of faith, which says, God from eternity decrees or permits all things that come to pass and perpetually upholds, directs, and governs all creatures and all events, yet so as not in any way, in any wise, to be the author or approver of sin nor to destroy the free will and responsibility of intelligent creatures. Some people view circumstances or providence as an open door or a closed door. Paul used those words in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 12 when he said that God has opened up a door for him to share the gospel in a particular place. We believe that God definitely did that. And I also think it's wise if you're wondering whether God is speaking a particular thing or impressing you in a particular direction, it's wise for the Word of God, for prayer, for circumstances. But also the Bible um, makes it clear that the church has ecclesiastical authority. So there are elders who are called to submit to God and they're to give an account for your soul. And so I think it's wise to, to let church leadership speak 
into your life on a particular situation so that you can see it lining up and guiding you with the Word of God. It doesn't mean that the church is the tell-all. It means the Scripture is being uh, brought to bear in the situation by leadership. Now, when it comes to, you say, well... I, I really want to know what God's saying. Just like Solomon who had God speak to, to him, I, I want God to speak to me through his word. What, what should I be doing? How should I discern the source of my thoughts? How, how do I know that this is not just something I saw on TV or something I dreamed? Or, or how do I know for sure? Well, let me give you some just quick tools here that you already know. Um, but James chapter 1 Pray. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who freely gives it. You need wisdom. You say, well, I've got wisdom on this situation. Well, you just proved to me you don't have any because you're thinking too highly of yourself. So pray for wisdom. Number two, study God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed. What's that mean? It means that God is the one who spoke the word. You want to know what God thinks about the situation? Read his word. He spoke it. Clearly, you can read it. 66 books of God-breathed Scripture. Now, some people are randomly just thinking that God can uh, speak to them and just randomly just open up the Bible, put your finger there, and that's how God speaks. One guy made the mistake of thinking that, and he opened up his Bible, pointed to this passage of Scripture, and his finger landed on, and Judas went out and hung himself. He says, well, that, that's probably not right. He did, tried it again. He opened it up, put his finger on the page, and his finger landed on what you must do, do quickly. Now, I don't think that's good advice on how to study the Word or look to the Scripture for answers. You're going to get in big trouble that way. So how do I study God's Word? You study it systematically, faithfully, in its context... And I would encourage you that that is, should be happening personally and privately. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 4 says it's the Word of God that's living and, and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It's not people's advice. It's the Word of God that helps discern what your motives are for doing things. And then I would say, quite simply, and I think that some people are not biblically informed on this either, and that is to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is where we get into trouble because some people who think we're so content-driven, so doctrine-driven, that we believe that the Holy Spirit's just not even active. We just learn facts about the Word of God. Well, I'm a firm believer that the Holy Spirit leads His people. We need to follow that leadership. And sometimes we don't even know what to do. And I'm thankful that Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27 tells us that we don't even know what to pray for sometimes, and the Spirit of God helps us in our weaknesses and intercedes for us to the Father in groans that are unexpressible, words that are unintelligible, inner heart issues, the Spirit of God, whom Psalm 139 says we can't get away from. He's with us everywhere. He's omnipresent. So, in light of hearing God... Here's some questions you might want to ask when you're trying to discern what God is saying. And we don't have a record like Solomon had of God literally saying these words and, and remembering them audibly. But one thing we can do is say this. Is God the author of confusion? The answer is no. 1 Corinthians 14 says that he's not the author of confusion. He's actually the producer of peace of mind. Do the thoughts that I'm having, do the, do the things that I'm thinking that God is indicating to me, do they go against the Word of God? Do these, do these things that I feel like the Spirit's leading me to do, they, do they lead me to sin? I've had people tell me before, I just feel like God's leading me to the, to the bar to win the drunk. Well, I'm not saying that He's not doing that. I'm saying, have you thought about your own vulnerability to sin? You need to consider those things. In addition, I would say you better make sure that you are reasoning this out with biblical thinking people. 
So how do I hear from God? How do I know that God is speaking to me? Folks, 1 Kings 9 is not your guide for how God speaks to New Testament Christians today. 1 Kings 9 is proof to the New Testament Christian that God is always speaking to his people. It is not a text to tell you how he is speaking to his people. We see that continued in the New Testament. But I want to bring to your attention, probably more than anything that we've been talking about thus far, is the interesting connection that 1 Kings chapter 9 has with 2 Chronicles 7. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles 7 for just a moment. If you are familiar with what we've said about the Gospels in the past, the Gospels are a, a four-person account of Jesus' life and ministry. So in the Gospels, you have Matthew writing to one audience for a particular purpose. You have Mark writing to a particular audience with a particular purpose. You have Luke writing to a particular audience for a particular purpose. And you have John writing to a particular audience for a particular purpose. Well, in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, you have a record of the kings of Israel, even in the divided kingdom. But you also have the chronicles, which are also not necessarily a parallel, but they are a complementary book to what is going on. And in our passage from 1 Kings 9, this is the parallel to a verse of Scripture that I want to read that has been used thousands upon thousands of times in recent days to promote the formula for revival. 2 Chronicles 7, beginning in verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Now, do you understand why it's a parallel account? Because it's what we've been reading about in Kings. But there is a little bit more detail, just like the Gospels. If we read the Gospels, we see a little bit more detail given by one, a little less detail given by another. And now in Chronicles, we're getting a little bit more detail about this prayer than we got in 1 Kings 9. Verse number 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, here we go. If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14, which is a bit of the prayer and conversation from the Lord to Solomon that we did not have in 1 Kings 9 is here and many, many well-intended preachers, pastors, leaders have used this text to promote, and I believe with good intention, to promote a revival, a return to God, a returning back to the one who has delivered them. And I believe that every principle mentioned in here, it's God's people, they're called by His name, they need to have humility, they need to pray, they need to seek God's face, they need to repent and turn from their sins, 
And God will hear from heaven and forgive their sin, heal their land. I believe the principles. But the context is referring specifically to ethnic nation Israel. This is critical. This is very important. Is it true that God could forgive the, forgive the sin and heal the land if people who are called by His name will humble themselves, seek their face, and turn from their sins? Yes, He could do that. But the context is specifically the nation Israel, ethnic Israel. The context is specifically when God puts on them a weather phenomenon called a drought, and they are unable to provide, and they are unable to sustain. What they need to do is turn towards the God of heaven who is the maker of the rain, and he will heal the land. By doing what? By sending rain to eliminate the drought and make it flourish. Are you saying, David, that these people who are using 2 Chronicles 7.14 should not be using 2 Chronicles 7.14? I understand in principle what they're trying to do. I understand what they're meaning by bringing this to our attention to say that if, if they will seek His face, but there's been a lot of misuse. Let me give you an example. And, and the reason why I'm telling you this, folks, is because you are Americans. Now, you need to listen close to what I'm saying here. You are Americans. I'm an American. But we got to be extremely careful to remember that we are not Americans first. You understand what I'm saying? We are pilgrims passing through. We are citizens of another kingdom. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we long and await for the Savior to split the clouds wide open and come and get his citizens of another kingdom. God in his providence has made us Americans. That's not sinful. But it is foolish to think, it is foolish to think that if we can just get our national leaders to lead us to the throne of grace. Listen, I, I, I'll just, I, I could parrot you some of the sermons that people preach. If we could just get our, our leadership, our president, our legislature, our, our, our governors our, to, to just humble themselves and, and seek His face and turn from wicked ways, then God's going to heal this nation and it'll become a... a a God-fearing nation and, and not a God-less nation. And that's what we need to do is we need to, we need to pray for, for, um, for our leaders. Well, you need to pray for your leaders, but that text is not telling me to pray for my leaders. And by the way, the United States is not the new Israel. You, you, listen, every passage that's referring to Israel that seems applicable to the United States does not mean that the United States fits the context. And by the way, if you want to be specific about it, if I want to make myself in this application and I want to make it spiritualized, I would have to say that it's not the legislator that is his people, it's the church. And so, so instead of the church calling on the leadership of a nation to humble themselves and seek his face, how about the church start by showing how to do that first? Because Peter said that judgment's going to begin at the house of God. Well, we just need some godly people in those situations. Listen, Corinthians tells us we're not responsible to judge those outside the church. We're to judge those inside the church. We are pilgrims passing through. We are citizens of another kingdom. But I do believe, 
I do believe when the psalmist said in Psalm 85, 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I do believe that there are times when we need to be revived. There are times when we need to be reminded of our first love. There are times. And even the word revival has lost so much of its savor these days. Margaret was getting annoyed at me yesterday when I was watching on YouTube some of the so-called revivals that have taken place in the, the United States in the 20th century and the little bit of the 21st century where places like Brownsville, places like Pensacola, places like Toronto, where there's more activity by Satan than there is by Jesus. And they're calling it revival. Revival. But in the mid-1700s, you can read about it and you can still read about it even in secular history books. There was a thing that's referred to in history as the Great Awakening. And let this go down in history. Most of the preachers in the Great Awakening were Calvinists. Shut your mouth. Hush your mouth. The Great Awakening was fueled by Calvinistic preachers. Jonathan Edwards. Who, by the way, was a cessationist. Who definitely did not suggest that revival is going to be showing up by foaming at the mouth, barking like a dog, falling in the floor, and convulsing. And then here comes George Whitfield. Here's a word for you who was first known as a Calvinistic Methodist. I, where, I thought Calvinist was a word that New Hope invented. I thought Calvinist was a word that the cults invented. No, these, listen, these are Calvinistic preachers evangelizing and sharing the gospel. And in the Great Awakening, by the way, a few hundred years, a few, not a few hundred years, a few decades before the Declaration of Independence in the United States of America, here comes this Great Awakening. And it doesn't mean that everybody in America got saved, got born again. But it does mean that there was such a resurgence of light bearing, salt of the earth Christians. That crime is at an all-time low. That morality is starting to increase among the, the nation. Among the 13 colonies. You keep reading through history and you, you'll come across what's called the Second Great Awakening. Kentucky has some of its roots there in the Second Great Awakening. But guess what happened in the Second Great Awakening? It was not as content-driven It was not as preacher, preaching expositionally the Word of God driven. Because you had people like Charles Grandison Finney who believed in the invitation system. You had situations like that. And as you continue to go on and on and on through history... The so-called revival term gets more and more bizarre. That's why we haven't had a scheduled revival. Somebody asked me one time, I said, do y'all have revivals? I said, I'm hoping for one every Sunday. Where God will revive our soul towards the Lord Jesus Christ through His Word. But as far as a scheduled revival, what are they meaning? Have you invited a guest preacher who nobody knows, who's good at animation and good at antics and strong on emotion, who can get us revved up? You say, no, we, we don't have those. I would rather the revival come through a normal means of spiritual disciplines by God's people. 
Let me give you some church historians who said some things about revival. Nancy Lee DeMoss said this, Revival is not just an emotional touch, it's a complete takeover. J.I. Packer, Revival is the visitation of God which brings to life Christians who have been sleeping and restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. Thence springs a vivid sense of sin and a profound exercise of heart in repentance, praise, and love with an evangelistic overflow. Charles Spurgeon said, If we want revivals, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. Leonard Ravenhill said, Revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being represented, misrepresented that He shows Himself. Leonard Ravenhill even said any true revival can be proven by the fact that it changed the moral climate of an area or a nation. If God is pleased to revive us again, what would that look like? Do we even need it? Do you need it? As Jimmy said last week, why are you here? Are you here because your relatives are here? Are you here because of the consequences if you're not here? Is that why you're here? Are you here because this is where my family goes? It's a cool place to be? Why are you here? Are you here because there's good children's programs? Are you here because we're about to eat subs? Why are you here? Do you even need to be revived? You see, I realize that pastorally, this is marking, this, this week is marking my 20th year at New Hope. And I, I've watched you and I've watched myself. I've watched us go through seasons where we are so strong on Bible content that we have missed the joy of that content. Where we are so strong on doctrine that we miss living in the satisfaction of the God of that doctrine. I've been there. Sometimes Jimmy leads us in that 1757 hymn written by a 22-year-old young man, Robert Robinson, who wrote the words to come thou fount of every blessing. Listen to what it says. O to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And listen to what he says about wandering. You're probably already saying it in your head. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. I don't care how happy of a day you have in worship. You are hours away from wandering from the God you love. Maybe even minutes. If God in His grace, by His Spirit, does not sustain you and restrain you. i tell you what my prayer is as I've jumbled all over the place with different thoughts. I t I t I'll tell you what my prayer is starting to become. Um, over the past years, I, I watch Moreland in particular because I'm here. I see Moreland becoming more of a, a drug transaction location. Um, it's pretty common. And... Um, I see morality going to an all-time low. There is no real concern for the neighbor. There is no concern for anything like that. And it's less and less um, a God-honoring, buckle-of-the-Bible-belt location. And I believe that if God did revive us both personally and corporately 
that not necessarily would everybody in Moreland become a convert to Christ. But what I do believe is that if God revives the Christian, that the light that they live out would shine brightly and clearly enough that those who long to do deeds of darkness will find very little comfort because there is such bright lights shining in the neighborhood, in the community, for the glory of Christ. And they will either come in the light because they need Him, or they will abandon their desires to do that here because light is too doggone bright from that beacon that we call New Hope. Let me tell you something. If you came here at night, you could read a newspaper in any area of this parking lot thanks to LED lights that shine bright enough to look like Millennium Park is lo relocated down here in Moreland. I'm telling you, I'm longing for God to revive our hearts in such a way, long to make us want Jesus in such a way, not that we'll be these social justice warriors, but so that we will just live out our faith. Period. And I guess the best way to drive home that point is to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. As we wrap up our time in Revelation chapter 2. The overarching theme, how does God speak? How do we know it's God? And the heart cry is revive us again. But not in some national way, but in a true heartfelt way. A true redemptive way. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. And before we go any further, remember the context is writing to a church. A church is constituted in the word ecclesia, called out body of believers. This is a regenerate receiver of this letter. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his hands, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Notice all of those commendations. Notice all of those things that the, the apostle says under inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this church is doing great. They're, they're enduring, they're patient, they're busy. Verse number two, they don't like false doctrine. Verse number two, they, they, they reject unsound doctrine. They're big on sound doctrine. And they're big on service. I know your works. Verse number three, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesakes. You've not grown weary. So they're, 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 they're busy to do deeds. They're big on sound doctrine. And when someone at Ephesus is talking maniciously about them or putting them down or, or misrepresenting them, Ephesus is not growing weary. They're not backing down. They're sound in doctrine. They're faithful in deeds. And yet, you can be sound in doctrine you can be faithful in deeds. You can be not enslaved to what people are saying and still have a problem listed in verse number 4. But I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. What love was this at first? What love was it at first that they had 
that he's talking about. It's the love they had before they were ever busy doing any deeds. It's the love they had before they were ever super sound in doctrine and understanding how to confront those false apostles. And It's the love that they understood and had that was quite childlike, by the way. Quite childlike. Now be careful here because you might be thinking, well, that's what we need to get back to. Just Jesus saves. I don't think the heart cry is to go back to that. I think the heart cry is never get over that. The heart cry is not stay foolish and infantile and immature in your faith. The heart cry is never lose the wonder of being saved. Don't get so smart doctrinally that you don't have a pitter patter and a joy in your heart about the fact that Jesus saved you from hell and from your sin. Don't get so caught up in your discussion and your winning of debates in doctrine that you forget that it's Jesus alone that is salvation. You've lost your first love. There was a time, Ephesus, when you had that kind of first love affection and deeds and doctrine and perseverance. So return to your first love. Verse number 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Here's another commendation, verse number 6. This you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. It's almost as if he says, you're doing things great. This is terrible. Here's another thing you're doing good that you should continue to do. Hate those false teachers, the Nicolaitans. Hate those unsound doctrine people who perpetuate this notion of unsound doctrine. He hates the deeds or works of them. So there's tons of commendation, but there's a, there's a big problem. Now, I, listen, I, I'm not trying to be as reactive as I am preventive here, pastorally. In the sense that, of this, we, we, we better be careful to understand, as Jimmy mentioned last week, why are we here? What is our motivation for living for Christ? Is it for what He can do for us, or is it because of who He is, point blank? I pray that you will examine yourself in light of this text. Now, what's interesting to me is in studying church history, there's ways to know whether this has happened or not. There's ways to know whether you've returned to your first love or not. There's ways to know whether you're having a personal revival of newfound affection or rekindled affection towards the Lord Jesus. There's ways to know this. Let me give you just a quick checklist. Jonathan Edwards, when he was preaching in the mid-1700s in the Great Awakening, and George Whitfield, they were often confronted because... They were told, hey, listen, this bizarre stuff's happening up here. How do you know that's of God? How do you know this is of God? How do you know this is happening? And this is what he did. He wrote a little essay on things you can't go on and things you can go on. Positive signs, things have really happened in someone's life and in a church, and things that have no bearing. I just want to give to you the things that is for sure so that if you ask me next week, man, David, I tell you, I, I, really, I really think that uh, what you said about returning to our first love, I think that's something I need to do. Well, what can I say to myself? What can I ask myself to actually know that I actually have returned to my first love? 
Jonathan Edwards gave five things. I want to end with that. Number one, you will know it is true when the operation is such as to raise their esteem of the Jesus who is true from the Bible. The Jesus who was born of the virgin, crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem, and is conforming more and establishing our minds in the truth of what the gospel declares to us of being the Son of God. He says that's a sure sign that the Spirit of God is at work to return you and revive you. So let me put it like this. First test. Are you more in love with the true Jesus from the Bible? Number one. Number two. When the Spirit does a true work of revival, the Spirit works against the interests of Satan's kingdom. Satan's kingdom, he writes, is about encouraging and establishing sin and cherishing men's worldly lusts. If the Spirit does a work against those things, you can be assured it is true. So, falling in love with Jesus as he is described in the Bible. Secondly, I'm less and less interested in worldly lusts and I'm more interested in Jesus. Number three, the Spirit does a work of reviving the soul in such a manner as to cause men to have a greater regard and devotion to holy scriptures. If you have said, I'm returning to my first love, and I ask you next week, how much have you read your Bible this week, and you say zero, I'm going to tell you, you are lying to yourself to suggest to me that you've returned to your first love. Because what you've done is you've told me you've returned to your first love and you've not talked to him or heard any word from him the whole week. Number four. Edward says that if the Spirit is at work in reviving the heart, we see that it operates as a spirit of truth convincing them of things that are true and right and noble. So we're not in dreamland anymore. We have some concrete things to sink our teeth into. And number five, if the Spirit is truly at work in reviving the heart, then the Spirit of God will operate in the person to produce a spirit of love to God and to man. We need to return to our first love. I think every one of us would admit that. How will we know God has done a work? Will you cherish Christ more? Will you have more of a passion to serve Him and less of a desire to cherish worldly lusts? Will you have a longing for more of time in the Word of God? Will you be more and more convinced that what God says is true? And will you have a love that's producing in you a, a love not only for God, but a love for people? The psalmist said this, Revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. I'm not praying that God make us all a bunch of weird Jesus freaks, but kind of. Kind of. The more we realize that we are enslaved to popular opinion, the more I hope He turns us into freaks. May God return us to our first love. May God return me to my first love, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.
As you're bowed there, if you have heard me talking about returning to your first love, Jesus, then you realize that I'm implying that you already have a relationship with Him and it has grown distant or cold. And that is, in fact, what I'm meaning. But maybe you're here and you have no relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me tell you that His payment on the cross was in the place and on behalf of any sinner who will call upon the name of the Lord. And whoever does shall be saved. Maybe that's you. I want to tell you that if that is you, the Bible tells us that the way to, to express that you're not ashamed of that is baptism. I'd love to talk with you more about that. If you're confused and help bring some clarity, I pray. But the vast majority of us, what's amazing to me about the Spirit of God is He takes the mess that I've made of jumbling all over the place with different scriptures and saying random things, and the Spirit of God zeroes in on the heart through His Word and knows exactly how to apply it. And I'm so thankful that it's not up to me. Father, I pray that as we gather together around your fellowship tables to enjoy a meal, I pray, God, that we would take seriously what's been said today. That we would be honest. And maybe we're even struggling with, do I need to rekindle a relationship with Jesus? Or do I need to begin one? And Lord, I pray you'd bring clarity and just bring whatever that situation is under your lordship. May we call on Christ for all of our needs. Be with us as we celebrate around the table together. In Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, new directions for the meal today. We are not going this hallway. We're going this hallway. For the sake of destroying tradition, we are going this way. Follow Chris Spears, who knew it beforehand and is trying to get there before anyone else. <laughs>